Well, this morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles here at Countryside Bible Church. We have been studying the book of Ephesians, and we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. We are reminding ourselves that Ephesians is an easy book to divide. The first three chapters deal with our position with Christ. For example, God has told us that he has chosen us before the foundation in him of the world, that is. So before you and I even were born, God had us in mind. And when time came for us to have faith in Christ, we came to faith as the Holy Spirit led us to that position to accept the gospel. Not only that, he tells us that we are sealed by the Spirit in him. Furthermore, we have a position in Christ, he tells us, that we are trophies of his grace. Uh, no oracles were ever written to us. They were written to Israel in the Old Testament. But to the Gentiles, no oracles were ever written. In fact, there was a middle wall of partition, but that has been broken down. The Jew and Gentile are now one in this age, and we have access to God. We don't have to go through a high priest like they did in the Old Testament. We can go directly to God. We have access to God. We are one in Christ, and we can stand in that position. Furthermore, this position came by grace. The Bible says in chapter 2, For by grace you're saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we have that right, and we have that position in the Lord. Then in chapter 4, he tells us that we ought to walk worthy of the calling which you have been called. God called us at a specific time at a spe spe specific era. It's no accident we're living in this time, folks. It's no accident that we're here for this day. We are here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are here to show the world what it's like to have a heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us, no matter if all of the economy goes kaput. God will take care of us. And all of God's people ought to say amen to that. And if you don't know the Lord, you have every reason to fear. Because whether it's a coronavirus or not, listen to me, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Just to be alive means you're going to die. And it's going to happen at some time, sooner or later, maybe the virus, maybe cancer, maybe a car accident, maybe a disease, maybe a heart attack. But it's all going to happen. So take advantage of this time, my friend, and look at your life in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that he came to save the world from their sins and give them eternal life. Well, our passage this morning is really taken from Ephesians 4.30. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It is interesting, as we got, came to chapter 4, he begins to list the various things. He begins to list that we're part of the body of Christ. It is the duty of the gifted persons, the pastor teachers, the evangelists, the apostles, the prophets. All of these were to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And then he gives us some things that we ought to observe. First of all, he tells us that we are to avoid the lying, and we're to speak truth with each other in 25. We're to have a rightful anger in verse 26, not a wrongful anger. And we're not to uh, steal any longer. And then in verse 29, we talked about the fact that let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Interesting that this verse occurs right here. <laughs> This could actually be the summation of the previous things we're not to do. In fact, all of these, it says, when it really starts, I don't pick this up in English, but I do pick it up in the Greek. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So this is in a line of what has already preceded. Prior to this, there were all imperatives or command. Don't lie, don't be wrongfully anger, angry, don't steal any longer, let no unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth, and now do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It is all the same kind of grammatical construction. They are imperatives, they are commands, and they're in the present tense, which means a continuing tense. 
And you could say when it put a do these things continually, but when you have the negative not before it, it means stop doing what you're doing. Stop lying. Stop stealing. Stop, uh, un uh, what should I say, corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. Stop it. And stop grieving the Holy Spirit. That is a summation. It's interesting that various sins can be committed against the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 7, the Israelites resisted the Holy Spirit. In Mar Matthew 12, verse 31, Jesus said, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we also read in 1 Thessalonians, quench not the Spirit. In Acts 5, they lied to the Holy Spirit. But let's take a look at that word, uh, grieve. <clears throat> when you take a look at the word grieve, it really is a interesting word meaning sorrow. The word comes to us in the English from lupus. Lupe ete is the word is in the Greek. And we have transferred it to the sickness called lupus. And it means sorrow. It means grief. It means anguish. So we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We are to stop doing it. The Old Testament example is used uh, many times in the Old Testament. There are 31 uses of the word lupo in the Old Testament. When they translated the Greek or they translated the Hebrew into the Greek, we got a Septuagint version, which was about 150 years before Christ. Now, when they translated, they used the word lupo. I'll just give you a couple examples. I'm not going through all uh, 36 of them, but the first one I'm going to give you is in Genesis 5, 45, verse 5, about Joseph. <clears throat> Do not be grieved, Joseph says to his brothers. Do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve your life. That's interesting. Joseph has been betrayed. They sold Joseph into slavery, and now they're all reunited again. What a beautiful story it is. And Joseph says, don't be grieved about this. This is for your good. I guess we could say that about today too, couldn't we? We don't have to grieve over the fact that we have this virus invading the land and that our economy and some of our jobs are in jeopardy. I feel sorry for you folks. And, but listen, God has a purpose. And in the Old New Testament, he said, for we know, and that know is absolutely, we know positively that all things work together for good to them that love God through them that are called according to his purpose. God will work this out. Hopefully in a couple of weeks, I'd like to be that po op optimistic, but I'm not. But I believe God will take us through it in one way or another. And this is an, ex you know, I'm off the subject already. But look, hasn't the church been kind of slack? Haven't we taken things for granted, our corporate worship services? And if we've got a family reunion, it's easy to, oh, well, it's just church. We're only missing church. And if we have some other activity, we're only missing church. We can go do church. We, they'll be there Sunday after Sunday. <clears throat> and then once it's taken, that corporate worship service is taken away from us. We realize there's more to that than what we thought. We miss the fellowship of one another. We, lift the, we miss the relationship of one another. Just the camaraderie we have one another. As I walked into church this morning, it was empty, no cars. And where men are generally drinking coffee and chewing the fat, it wasn't there. And I looked around, the, the children's section is empty. The nursery is empty. It's empty. But I'm so thankful God has given us this way. Also, David crying over death of Absalom. We read this in 2 Samuel 19.2. The victory that the day was turned to mourning for all the people, for the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. And you know, in another place, he cried, Absalom, oh Absalom. He was grieved. That's our word. That's our word. In the New Testament, grief is used 26 times and 15 times by Paul. 
And again, the word in the New Testament is the same as the old. Lupo is grief, pain, sorrow, and distress. In Matthew chapter 17, we have an example of that as we're getting closer to Easter. Jesus says in Matthew 17, 22 to 23, And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and they will ra- he will be raised on the third day, and they were deeply grieved. Wow. They felt, they felt distressed. They were sorrowed over it. They were hurt by it. But I like the one in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, where Paul really uses this word. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 11. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, and that's our word grief, sorrow, I did not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you lupo, sorrow, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made lupo, sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful, lupo, to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful, according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow, lupo, that is according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. All the grief you can have and fear over this virus is warranted on your part if you don't know the Lord. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, and what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong in everything you demonstrated yourself to be innocent in this matter. So, grieving is making sorrow. Now he says we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Now the Holy Spirit is not an influence. You can't grieve an influence. You can grieve a person. But you cannot grieve an influence. Even though, and in this passage, by the way, we have the full title of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God a very God. He is a person. And even though theologians call him the third person of the Trinity, that is not to minimize his deity, nor is that to minimize his work or minimize who he is. When they talk of the third person of the Trinity, they are looking at the role that the Holy Spirit plays in the world and the universe and in creation. Since the Holy Spirit, let's talk about this a little bit. Since the Holy Spirit is God of very God, he is not dependent on anyone. He, in fact, along with God the Son and God the Father, had perfect harmony in all eternity past. As far as you can go past, in the past, and there's never any end of it, they had perfect harmony. They didn't need anybody. They didn't need a world let alone a world that would uh, react against them. They didn't need all this. They were self-existent. So how can he be grieved? How can someone who is self-existent, totally independent, nothing can touch him, always filled with fullness and satisfaction, how in the world can the Holy Spirit be grieved? It's a mystery. It's incomprehensible, really, when you think about it. But it is related to our redemption. It is related to our reconciliation. It is related to the mercies of God. Remember God, the Son, became a man. In fact, we've been studying about this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, as we know him today, was God a very God. He is the one who spoke the words of creation in Genesis chapter 1, and the Holy Spirit is the one who moved upon the waters. So all of them had a part. God planned it, Jesus spoke it, the Holy Spirit executed it and did it. So his being grieved as a part uh, and part of the whole plan of redemption and reconciliation. 
just as God the Son became a man of very man. Just to clarify it, God is, Jesus is God of very God, and he is also man of very man. It's a mystery that we cannot comprehend, but he is fully man in every sense of the word. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired. He knew sorrow, he knew everything. He knew all of the experiences of life. And uh, what a humbling thing it was when Jesus humbled himself. He went all the way to death, and he also went to the one of the worst capital punishments that man offered, and that was to hang on a cross. I sometimes think about this when I think of my own demise. Um, I'm not particularly looking forward to death. I would rather the Lord come for the church before that. But one of the encouraging things to me is my Savior and my Lord and very God, a very God and very man, a very man went through death. He went through that. He humbled himself just to pay the penalty for our sins. Well, now let's look at the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to live in us. He came to live in us. Since he dwells in us, it is possible to grieve him, make him sorrowful. Every person who knows Christ as their Lord is indwelt by the Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says this. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In other words, at the point of faith, when you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, simultaneously as you breathed out in faith, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved. Also look at John chapter 14, verse 16, which is the upper room discourse. And right after the taking of the communion, the Lord's table, and the Lord begins to speak to them that he's going away. And uh, disciples are really kind of shocked about all this, even though they've had periodic instruction from the Lord about this. And so he says, I will send another comforter, another advocate in my place. Jesus on earth was located in one spot. He was either in Capernaum or he was either in Jerusalem <clears throat> or he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in one spot at one place. But he says, when I go to heaven, you will all have a comforter, an equal comforter, the Holy Spirit. Then he makes this announcement in 14, John 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper that he may be with you, how long? Forever. Get it? Forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you. Look what he says to the disciples now and will be in you. Now, that's interesting because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and left. The Holy Spirit wasn't a permanent indwelling person in every believer forever. Je uh, David received the Spirit in order to enable him to be the king. And when he sinned, his confession in Psalm 51 was, don't take away the Spirit from me. We don't pray that prayer today because we have the Holy Spirit as a permanent resident within us forever. Wow. He's a gift to us. He lives within us. And the day of Pentecost is when that place took place. Remember, he told his disciples, wait for the Spirit in Acts chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we have further instruction about this where we read this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, which you have from God, and you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. Wow. 
we make a big thing about this countryside and people kind of ridden me about it, but we don't call this a sanctuary. I'm preaching in a, almost an empty sanctuary this morning, but it's really not a sanctuary at all. We call it the worship center. Because the last sanctuary that was a building on earth was a temple. That's where God dwelled, in the temple. In fact, the dwelling of God in the temple left 560 years before Jesus was born, as he, the Shekinah glory went back to heaven. But that's where the Lord dwelt there. And when they were in the wilderness, they could see the light over there, and that's where the presence of the Lord was seen. However, today, every born-again believer, every person who names Christ as their Lord, that person is a temple of the Holy Spirit. They are the house of the Holy Spirit. Here is where he takes up permanent residence. And every person has the Holy Spirit, all of him. Not partial. You don't get a little bit, bit of piece of this and a little bit of, bit of piece of that. So the Holy Spirit is in every person. He's within your body. The relationship we have with the Holy Spirit is one of love. He loves us. He loves us. We deal with him in love. Therefore, it is possible to grieve him. The sins of lying angry being wrong, angry wrongfully stealing being bitter wrathful clamor and slander which we'll see in the next few verses all grieve the holy spirit who loves us in fact the love of the holy spirit and we loving the spirit is is a growth to maturity may actually be the heart of sanctification when you really get down to it how would you think if you were a guest in a home and you were going to be living there permanently, but the host and hostess uh, did things to make you sorrowful. You ever been in a house where you really knew you weren't wanted? It just felt eerie and you felt grieved. You know, that's when we grieve the Holy Spirit. We ignore him. How would you like to be in a house where they ignore you? They all go in and get a a Coke or something and get a soft drink or bring water in and they have a meal and they never call you to it or they never may, never uh, show you where you could uh, make yourself at home that's grieving the Holy Spirit it's like a guest at home he is grieved and we ignore him this verse may be describing as we said the heart and soul of sanctification our sanctification is a personal relationship to the Spirit of God. Our growing in Christ is not the law or breaking the law, but a grievance that caused the Holy Spirit. Paul does not say that in order for you to live in the area of the law and to really be happy, you have to stop the sin which so easily besets you. You know what he says? Be filled, be controlled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control you. Let him be in charge. We're not to conform to a list of ethics, but to the one who loves you. Our service now is not one of legalism, but it's one out of love. I do these things because of my love, just like for a child or for your mate. You do things for them because you love them. You don't do things because you love them and you know that if you did it, it would hurt them, so you don't do it. And that is our relationship to the Holy Spirit, and that is the grieving part of the Holy Spirit. We hurt him. We distress him. I, I have really grown over the years to have a great appreciation for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ministry in our life is really very interesting, isn't it, when you stop and think about it. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to faith. In John chapter 16, verses 8 and 11, we read about this, where he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. 
He convicts us not of sins. It's singular. He convicts us of the sin of unbelief, of not believing in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he convicts us of righteousness. Righteousness because we know we are sinners and we are unrighteous. And he shows us the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness we need to be accepted by God. And then he convicts us of the fact that there is a judgment. I believe that down deep in the heart of everybody's soul, they know there's a judgment coming. And a lot of times when you visit with people and you say, what is your standing before God? They say, well, I hope my righteousness, my goodness outweighs my badness. And it's almost like there's a judgment scale and they're weighing it and they're hoping that what they do will overcome the bad things they do because they sense innerly there is a judgment. The beautiful thing about it is the judgment has already taken place for our sins. Christ died on the cross and he paid for that and you can have eternal life and forgiveness of all your sins if you will just repent of them and place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who was buried and rose again for us in coming back. So he has convicted us of this. Now his ministry of sealing is mentioned here. Sealing identifies the believer as belonging to God. This was done by the Holy Spirit. We read it in Ephesians 1.13. In him you also, after having listened to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, that's Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. When a person believes they are united with Christ and God puts his spirit, puts his seal on it. Now, when, you know this, when, they, when Jesus was buried, they rolled a stone over the grave and they put a seal on it. Now, compared to the stone and compared to the stone grave, that seal was probably wax. But it had a Roman stamp on it. And that seal would never hold the rock if you decided to roll the rock away from the grave, which the angel did. But when you went up there, you would see that seal, that Roman seal, and it would say to you, if you move this rock, the whole power of the Roman Empire will come down on you. So the seal itself gives one uh, security. It gives us security. It also is a seal which we have security in Christ. Another ministry of the Holy Spirit while we're on it is a person, when a person believes in Christ, they are united to him through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, when people hear the word baptism, they immediately want to run to water. They want to go to a creek, a river, or a baptistry. They want to go there and do it. But when we're reading this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one water, not in one water, in one body. It is not talking of water. It's talking of identification. That's what baptism at its root basis is. When you are baptized... You are identified with a group of believers or a church, or you are baptized with some religious faith. You are in, it's an initiation, a public initiation identification to it. You know, you have the baptism of fire, which is judgment. You have the baptism of Moses, where all the people were drowned in the, in the Red Sea. You have other baptisms as well. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when Christ... The Bible being us, here's Christ over here. The Holy Spirit takes us out of the world and puts us into Christ. We are one in the body with him. And then we've already talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit came to indwell us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you 
and you have no one need no need for anyone to teach you but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true is not a lie and just as it has taught you you abide in him so we have the spirit teaching us and leading us and furthermore in chapter 5 verse 18 the holy spirit is that gracious has that gracious control over us do not quite be drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So some observations about sealing, just to remind us. A seal speaks of security, and the seal is as secure as the one who seals it. And in Ephesians, it's God himself, the Holy Spirit. A seal speaks of authenticity, genuineness. For a number of years ago, we had people that were tampering with medicine, remember, and they would open a medicine or something, stick something else in it. So now every time you open a cap of something, it's got a seal on it. And that seal guarantees that this came from the factory and is still from the factory. So it's a guarantee of authenticity, of genuineness, of real, realness. And also a seal speaks, speaks of ownership. When you and I became Christians, we belong to God and we no longer belong to the kingdom of Satan. Colossians 1.13 says, He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We are now owned by him. We need to live for him and by him. Every person who has come to Christ, realizing they're a sinner, trusted as Christ as their Savior, the Lord and the Lord is sealed and were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And how long does this last? It said forever in John. But here it says, for the day of redemption. A rather unique phrase for Paul, but we all understand what it means. He wrote in Titus, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the day of redemption is unique to Paul, but what he means is this. We're sealed until Christ comes back for us. We're in a day we're uh, suffering from viruses, cancer, heart trouble, acts of God of all kinds, accidents, disasters. Our life, as we said earlier, is pretty precarious. We don't know what the day will hold at all. And just because we're alive, we're going to die. And we're all looking, who are believers, looking for the day when God will give us a new resurrection body, no pain, no sorrow. None of these afflictions. In fact, he says in Romans 8, 23, And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even as we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. All you have to do is get a little older and you start longing more and more for that redemption of your body. Or if you have an illness, you start reading. Or if you are handicapped or anything, but you know Christ, you're going to get a brand new body. And I've often told the people, look, the length of your life down here, 90 at the most, maybe 100 at the most for sure. How does that compare to 1,000 years in heaven? How does that compare to 10,000 years in heaven? How does that compare to a million years in heaven? Just of 90 years, 80 years, 70 years, 60 years? With a brand new body that lives forever, that is not subject to the curse of which we're all under living on this earth. We look forward to that. In 2 Thess 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When's this going to happen? I don't know. Nobody in October anticipated what we're going through right now. And yet, it could all end for every believer the Lord come during the midst of this crisis. We don't know. Could be tomorrow. Could be another 10 years. We have no idea. 1 Corinthians 1.8, Paul said, Who will also confirm you to the end, 
blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day of redemption, we're going to stand there blameless because of the crucifixion and work of Jesus Christ on the cross, having become our substitute and judged in our place, bearing our hell for us and granting to us brand new life. Philippians 1, 10 to 11, that you may approve these things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Again, blameless until the day of Christ. That's our hope. Our hope is not the government's going to bail us out. Our hope is not suddenly God is going to just vanish this away. He could if he so desires. But our hope is in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the position we have. And the last but not least, Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. You know, take advantage of the coronavirus. Take advantage of these days to encourage one another, as we've already reminded you this morning. And take advantage to talk to your neighbor about Jesus Christ. And tell him as he prepared, really for the Lord, even in the midst of this pandemic, he can know the Lord and be sure. Brothers and sisters, this is a day to get in the word and pray. You're not going to be encouraged from the news. You're not going to be encouraged from the word. In fact, if you sit and listen to the news, you're going to be discouraged. My advice to you is step up your Bible reading, get in contact with one another, encourage one another. And we at Countryside, the pastoral staff and our elders and those of us at the church will do everything to encourage one another along with you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and its encouragement. May you use us for your honor. And for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.